Thank you. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a, a terrific range of speakers from across the spectrum and indeed speaking styles. But we've saved the best till last because our next speaker is a former chairman of the Conservative Party. He was a shadow Home Office Minister for many, many years. But crucially, crucially, he was the Minister for Europe back in the 1990s. He's been to Brussels. He knows how it works on the inside. And unusually for an elected politician, he's a rather nice chap who's even quite popular. Please welcome David Davis. First, a piece of advice. Never, ever follow Nigel Farage on stage. <laughs> and I might have been popular, but I wasn't exactly popular when I was the Minister for Europe. My nicknames were uh, Monsieur Non in France, Herr Niet in Germany, and since there are ladies in the audience, I won't tell you what they call me in Spain. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the terrible things about doing this sort of thing is coming on last. The, I, I once uh, before had to speak at the end of a conference, and I sat there, rather as I've done this evening, listening to speaker after speaker. At that time, it was the Lord Chief Justice and the Attorney General and various other people uh, getting up and giving all my best lines. And as I got to the, do the, uh, the door of the auditorium to go in to speak myself, I said to the, the doorman, I said, you know, this is really worrying. Everything's already been said. And he said, yes, sir, he said, everything's been said, but not everything has been said by everybody yet. You know. so, so let me, in that light, try and pick up some of the points, and I, it's going to be a very brief speech, uh, uh, to, to pick up some of the points that have been made by some of the speakers already uh, tonight in this magnificent conference, frankly. Uh, and I'm going to start um, uh, with something that sort of Kate alluded to. But it, it, if you like, it's a... Uh, it's a sort of antidote to the inferiority complex that the British establishment seems to be suffering from at the moment. And I'd just like you all to sit there and think for a minute how lucky you all are. Because you have the privilege of living in one of the greatest nations on earth. And, and Kate did allude to this. I mean, you know, how is it, you know, a little island on the cold northwest coast of Europe has no real reason to expect to be a permanent member of the UN Security Council, a leading member of NATO, the leading member of the Commonwealth, the fifth biggest economy in the world, and yet we are. And we're also the nation of Isaac Newton and William Shakespeare and Rutherford and Faraday and James Watt and Alexander Fleming. We're also the country that inve invented the Industrial Revolution. We're also the country that created the first modern liberal parliamentary democracy. We're also the country that actually uh, set down and first believed in the freedom under the law and the liberal tolerance, which has now become the norm in all of civilized society. And of course, above all of that, our language, the English language, is the dominant language of the intellectual world in science, in engineering, in medicine, on the internet, if you accept American as English, in media, <laughs> in commerce and law. Our judicial system is widely viewed as the fairest in the world. Even Russian oligarchs go to the Royal Courts of Justice to sort out their disagreements. And we have a worldwide reputation for fairness and honesty. One of the things I learned when I was a Foreign Office Minister, it was really irritating. Everybody expected me to keep my word every time. You know. <laughs> That's our history, our heritage, and it should be our future. <clears throat> and it belongs to all of us. You know, whether your name is Smith, Jones, Campbell, Heffer or Hoey, or Patel or Chakrabarty, 
or Davis, or even a French one like Farage. You know. <laughs> it's ours. And more than that, and again, Kate alluded to this slightly, it's a way of life that millions of people died for. Many of them, the Commonwealth citizens that we put behind us, shamefully, those years ago. And we had all of that before we joined the European Union. Every single bit of it we had before we joined the, single, uh, the European Union. We don't owe any of that to anybody else, except perhaps those Commonwealth citizens who spilt blood for us. Now, that's not true for most other European nations. Just think about it. Germany, Italy and France created the forerunner of the European Union after decades of dictatorship and defeat, or both. Spain joined after getting rid of the dictator, Franco. Portugal died after, uh, joined after Catano. The Greek, Greece joined after the colonels. Eastern Europe joined after they escaped from the jackboot of Soviet domination. So it's hardly surprising that they see Europe as symbolic of democracy. It was the first thing they had after they left dictatorship and dominion behind them. But for us, it's not like that. We had 200 years of liberal democracy be behind us before we joined. And as Graham said, Graham Brady said, we understand it rather than better than most. Because democracy is not just about casting a vote. Democracy is about being able to get rid of bad governments. And how do you get rid of the European Commission? And well, actually, we're going to have a chance on the 23rd of June. You know, as John Dunn didn't say in these terms, but he said something which raised in my mind a thought that I, I discussed some 20 years ago. And that is, you know, the nation state is a moral concept. You won't get a German saying that, I promise you. you know. A nation state is a moral concept. Why? because it's the highest manifestation of real democracy. And that's why we should hang on to our nation state, treasure it, love it, keep it, and get it back. Now I'm gonna try and summarize in 90 seconds a speech it took me an hour to give yesterday. But the, the simple point is really this. If, as I believe we will, we vote to leave on June 23rd, we can do so on perfectly amicable terms with the rest of Europe. And I mean Europe now, not the European Union. We can do it on perfectly amicable terms with the rest of Europe. Different nations have different destinies, and we should be comfortable with that. And make no bones about it. We have a fantastic free trading future ahead of us outside the European Union. We can strike, we can, we can strike free trade deals in a year or two, which takes the European Union decades to get to. And by the way, it's not widely known, but we've now published the statistics that uh, most of the European Union deals, fair, uh, free trade deals, actually disadvantage this country, don't advantage it. And they take us a say forever to do it. If you look at other countries, little Switzerland uh, can do better deals than the European Union with bigger countries. They've got one with China, the EU hasn't. Australia struck deals with China and Japan and South Korea all in less than two years. So if little Switzerland can do it, surely Great Britain can do it. Yeah. Now, that's not a formula for losing jobs. It's a formula for more jobs. And yes, one of those free trade deals will be with Europe. And of course, those who want us to vote in, what do you call the people who want us to vote in? The in crowd? Anyway, the in crowd tell us that we won't be able to strike such a deal. And by the way, have you noticed that absolutely the, entire, in the entirety of the in crowd argument is basically threats and blackmail? 
every single component. There's not a single constructive argument in the in-crowd approach. They say the Europeans would not want to do such a deal. Well, if you know, want to know why they're wrong, you've got to remember two things. You've got to do two things. Firstly, you've got to remember that actually, and I speak as, as a former Europe minister, actually the way Europe works is as a battle of national interests take place inside the Council of Europe. That's what happens. And, of course, the bigger and more dominant ones get their way more often than others. We actually lose twice as many times as everybody else, but the bigger and more dominant ones. And you can guess who the biggest and most dominant one is. Now, if you want to see why they won't do, uh, they won't walk away from a deal with us, and Nigel sort of alluded to it, go out onto the street and count the cars. You know, count the Audis and the BMWs and the Mercedes and the Volkswagens. They're the ones with the smoke trail behind them. Um, you know, go out and count them because they are more than a quarter of all cars sold in Britain. And Britain is the second fastest growing car, and sorry, it's not the second fastest, it's the fastest growing car market in Europe. And under the WTO rules, which is the minimum that the uh, European Union could deal with us, the minimum, the one category of product which gets a, other than uh, agriculture, which is excluded, uh, the one category of project, product which gets a very high tariff, 10%, are cars. And the, and the Germans sell 16 billion to us from Germany alone. If you add in the Skodas and the Fiats and the Seats and so on, it goes, up to about, it, it goes up to about 26 billion for Europe as a whole. The day after Brexit, there will be a hammering on Angela Merkel's door from the chief executives of Audi, BMW, Mercedes and Volkswagen demanding not that we get allowed access to Europe, but that they get allowed access to us. And if they can sell their cars here, we can sell our products there. So the blackmail is nonsense. Those threats will collapse. They already have. They already have. I mean, I just look, had a look uh, on the way up. You've got Toyota, Nissan, Airbus, BMW, Opel, Volkswagen have all now changed their mind. They're all now saying they'll continue to invest after Brexit takes place. They're beginning to see the writing on the wall, and like all businesses, they're beginning to live with it. But you know the other thing about this, and, and it, it, I think it's a major misjudgment of, of the in crowd, uh, and that is that they think the British people will respond well to threats. That is not our history. You know, we've had threats before, and some of them I can understand. Napoleon I can understand, you know. The Kaiser I can understand, Hitler I can understand, you know, Stalin, Brezhnev, those I can understand, but Hermann von Rompuy? You know, <laughs> really, you know. So it's not going to work. It's not going to work. But, you know, this is not just about trade. That's where the fight will be, because that's where the scare stories will mostly be. But it's not just about trade. It's about our freedom. The issue that matters to me in politics more than anything else is freedom and justice. And it's about our rights to determine our own freedoms and our own justice system. It's about national self-determination. It's actually about national pride. And one of my favorite poems, and I'll finish on this, one of our favorite, my favorite poems is a, it's a poem called The Secret People by G.K. Chesterton. And it's a very complex poem about our history and about our battles with ourselves and with the French and with the French and with the French. Um, and, um, but there's, there's, there's a very, very famous few lines from it. And I'll just read them out to you as I finish. It says, you laugh at us and love us, both mugs and eyes are wet. Only you do not know us, for we have not spoken yet. Smile at us, pay us, pass us but do not quite forget, for we are the people of England that never has spoken yet. On June 23rd, the people of England will speak. The people of Scotland will speak. The people of Wales and Northern Ireland will speak. And I believe they will say to the European and indeed the British establishments in strong, clear voice, give us back our heritage. 
Give us back our country. Give us back control of our own national identity. Take us out of this awful organisation. Thank you very much. Well, folks, we've got a few little written questions that have come in. Um, so I'm going to quickly run through a few and direct them at various uh, members of the panel. Um, actually, I'm going to direct this first one to David because you just kind of finished on the June 23rd. Um, the first question was, when do you think the referendum will be? <laughs> Obviously, we have heard that you think it's June the 23rd. And this person asked, do you think it really matters when it should be? Does it even matter? Oh yes, it, uh, oh, yes, it matters. Um, uh, the June of 23rd is the date that sort of suits the government, um, or at least it did until before this week. Um, uh, and that is because they don't want much debate on this. Their argument is appallingly weak. Their proposals are visibly poor. Um, we will win that argument. Uh, the longer it goes on, the more we will win it. So a short period is helpful to them. But the other thing that will happen if we go later than that is that we will see on our TV screens a visible demonstration of the failures of the European Union particularly in a form of children drowning, trying to get into the, uh, into the country, the failure of the, of the border controls, the refugee camps, uh, all of that, you'll see that. You may also, the longer it goes on, see a resurrection of the euro crisis. I think the financial uh, world at the moment is pretty unstable. And, I mean, actually, Niger was really quite polite about the EU in what they have done to Greece. It's immoral. People have died in Greece because of the EU, because of the Euro. Hospitals have been closed. Doctors have worked for nothing. People have starved. Uh, people, the suicide rate has gone up astronomically. All these things, the run of history will be against the government. So the faster they can do it, the better from their point of view. But that doesn't mean we aren't going to have a really good fight between before then. So. Thank you, David. Thank you. We Time is moving on, so I'm go I've, I've been asked just to do one more question, which I'm actually going to send to Kate, seeing as she's the, she's the only other lady here on the platform, and she was so marvellous, I'm not going to apologise for directing it at Kate. Kate, the key to a successful ground campaign is a high number of motivated volunteers, such as the members of the audience here today. What would you say to committed Euro? skeptics to urge them to go out onto the streets and to get people to vote to leave the EU? Well, you're absolutely right. This will be won by, by people, the kind of people who are here tonight. It won't be won by uh, politicians. And that why, that's why I find the whole thing about, you know, who's going to lead this campaign is the great sort of thing that the media continually harps on. I think the campaign will be led by people like you. And I think what, what each person has to do, as I mentioned earlier, you know, every day, actually think who have you persuaded or who have you told some information who have you managed even when you're shopping I do it actually all the time now I bring every opportunity I can when I'm talking to people even coming up on the train and say I, I I don't quite blame everything on the EU but I say well we've got the chance to get out of this and you know we really have to just be um, evangelists for this great cause because we won't get another chance. And the thing that really, really, I think sh people should be warned about, if we vote, if we happen to vote to remain in, by even a very, very narrow majority, the European Union Commission will make sure that from that very moment, anything that the, Europe, that the UK wants, they try to get, they will be simply put back in their box and told, your people voted to stay in this. What are you arguing about? So, it, you know, it is absolutely crucial that we get out. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, just before I end on with a few comments, can I just remind everybody about the cards that Tom spoke about earlier? And if you could please remember uh, to fill them in. Ladies and gentlemen, before you go, can I ask you to put your hands together, please, for our marvellous panel of speakers this evening.
Since, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sincere thanks to the organisers of this event and to all of those who have helped to make tonight such a great success. I have no doubt that the Grassroots Out campaign will go from strength to strength and continue to garner support from across the country. Because you know, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter how many politicians you hear debate. It doesn't matter how many arguments and counter-arguments we hear or how many statistics either side can produce. It is about something far more fundamental. It's about the lives that we all lead. It's about the communities in which we all live. And you know what? It's about the legacy that we're going to leave behind. Let us be the people who continue to campaign and defend this great nation, not just for those who have given so much and gone before us, but let's do it for those who have yet to come. Let us make Britain great. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and good night. Thank you.